Um, I have no conflicts of interest. I have only alignments of interest. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you a, a brief history of uh, focus ultrasound in the brain, uh, a little bit about the technology, the challenges, uh, what the what the clinical workflow looks like in a nutshell, and uh, you know some of the coming attractions in terms of the technology. I think the following talk will will cover in more detail uh, the different clinical indications. All right, so uh, high intensity ultrasound, uh, even apart from focus ultrasound, kind of goes back to uh, 1916 with Paul Langevin. He had the, really the first practical application of uh, the piezoelectric effect. He invented sonar for the de detection of submarines uh, in World War I. This is basically a piezoelectric quartz crystal uh, behind a steel plate to emit a strong ultrasonic pulse and using a hydrophone to detect any echoes. So fast forward uh, to the 50s and, and uh, people began to I uh, tried to use this technology in the brain. So Peter Lindstrom and Lars Luxell around 1950 and a little bit beyond uh, built a single element system. Uh, Lars Luxell treated a number of patients. Uh, now that obviously this was subject to a number of uh, limiting technological constraints. Uh, they didn't really know how to get ultrasound through the bone in a, in a uh, focused way. So this was done through a craniectomy. There's no such thing as tomography. Uh, there's no such thing really well. Uh, stereotaxy was kind of in its infancy. So seeing a target, much less uh, aiming at one, was a bit of a challenge. Uh, the results were a little variable given all of those things. And uh, Lars Lexell actually went on to, uh, to focus his attention on radio surgery and what ultimately became the gamma knife. But he did actually build a working focus ultrasound system for the brain. On the other side of the pond, the Fry brothers also, uh, in this case, built a multi-element system. Uh, they treated a number of patients with Parkinsonian disorders, but suffered from the same limitations. They, they had to use a craniectomy. Uh, it really was, uh, image guidance really just wasn't there, uh, let alone being able to see what you're actually targeting. And so they, they had some positive results, but really was kind of mixed. And then following uh, this experience, focused ultrasound in the brain really went silent for 40 or 50 years. And uh, why is that? Well, a lot of interesting things happened between 1950 and the end of the 20th century. So, you know, at the same time people were playing with focused ultrasound in the brain, the transistor was invented, uh, which, you know, led to uh, the mini computer and the microcomputer and so on. It's interesting that the PDP-8 in the bottom left there was famous because it was portable meaning you could fit it in a car. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so you know, I, for reasons I hope uh, will be clear later, uh, you know, a certain amount of, of computational resources was necessary to make focus ultrasound, at least through the intact skull, possible later on. Stereotaxy developed during this time. Uh, and of course, uh, as you all know, uh, CT and MR arise a little bit later uh, and become the basis uh, not only for modeling the skull, which we'll talk about a little bit later with CT, but um, all the wonderful things we can do with MR, which is what this conference is all about. So from there uh, to the, the 90s and early 2000s, uh, you know, the, all of these technologies finally came together. Uh, so Calervo Hinnanen and Frank Yolez at all uh, at the Brigham and, and uh, at Harvard, they developed a, a 500 element phased array and they showed not only could they get ultrasound through the skull in, in a focused way, We'll talk more about the challenges of that, but they, they could also use this phase array for steering the target around. So this was kind of the, the watershed event for uh, the, the, the clinical translation of this technology. And now, you know, almost a uh, hundred years after Paul Langevin, we, we have uh, the first FDA approval last summer uh, for focus ultrasound, MR guided of uh, essential tremor and with some other things in the pipeline, uh, which I think you'll hear in the next talk. Uh, these are the two commercial devices that exist today. Uh, Insight Tech device on the left, uh, mated with a GE system, and the uh, supersonic Imagine system on the right, mated with a, with a Siemens magnet. Uh, only the Insight Tech system so far has any clinical experience, but there actually are two of these things uh, in the wild. They, they both consist, obviously, of, of a magnetic resonance scanner a, a large phased array transducer, a coupling water bath, uh, stereotactic, or at least an immobilization system. Uh, 
uh, for, for uh, mounting the patient into all of this. All right, so uh, just to kind of quickly give you a sketch of, of what uh, the treatment can look like. So before the treatment, uh, a high resolution CT is required and, and this is part of what's necessary to gather the data to model the, the patient's skull so that ultrasound can get through it. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, some amount of planning can be done and, and at least up until now, uh, all these patients' heads are, are shaved in order to get uh, good acoustic coupling without any trapped air bubbles and so forth. The morning of the treatment, uh, the patient has a stereotactic frame placed, a flexible silicone membrane. I'll show a, a kind of a, a cartoon of that in a minute uh, to uh, couple their head to the transducer through a water bath. The patient's position on the table, the transducer is filled with water. Uh, the transducer itself is localized. Uh, and place such that its geometric focus is as close to the, the desired anatomic target as possible. And then uh, some planning images are usually acquired for uh, doing the targeting. So it, it, this is sort of a, a cutaway of uh, a head in a stereotactic frame um, in relation to the transducer. This would all be ultimately moved into the bore of the magnet. Um, the patient has a, this kind of floppy uh, silicone membrane mounted on their head just above the pins of the frame, and this gets mounted with a, via an O-ring to the transducer. That whole space between the patient's scalp and the transducer is filled with degassed water, uh, which just allows efficient transit of the ultrasound through the water bath. Uh, and it's also chilled, uh, which helps not only to cool the transducer, which is something like 50% or a little bit better efficient, so there is some waste heat there that needs to be uh, taken away, but also keeps the skin and to some degree the outer table of the skull cooled and uh, helps all of that return to baseline between exposures. So once the patient is, is mounted into the system and you're ready to go, there's essentially two phases, uh, a target verification phase and a power titration phase. So the, the first steps are usually done with very low power uh, exposures or sonications that raise the temperature a, a few degrees enough that they can be seen with uh, MR thermography um, to verify that the, the transducer focuses where we want it to be. For now, clinically, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes, but uh, clinically really limited to 2D um, MR thermometry at the moment. So in order to really verify the location of the hot spot, this has to re be repeated in several different orientations. I'll try to show an example of that in a minute. Um, once uh, there's confidence that the hot spot is actually happening where we want it to happen, then the power is gradually raised uh, while the, the temperature is monitored with MR uh, until the point where the peak temperature that the, the surgeon desires is reached, and this is usually somewhere between 55 and 60 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, along the way, uh, these patients are uh, wide awake, uh, can report symptoms. So on the way toward uh, the final destination of the peak temperature, the patients can report symptoms and that can sometimes lead to the refinement of the target, uh, kind of in a similar way to that uh, you might see with RFA in the past. Uh, once the uh, the peak temperature is reached, uh, the water bath is drained, the frame is removed, the patient gets some follow-up imaging. Uh, determining whether you've really completed the treatment is, is one of the areas of, of investigation at the moment. So th there's a generally empirically found uh, correlation with peak temperature and patient outcome, but uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, using MR beyond thermometry to, to do uh, treatment monitoring either with diffusion or uh, magnetization transfer or other techniques. All right, so I'm just going to show very quickly, this is a playback of a treatment. It's about 12 sonications long, um, and the, the color overlay is, is the temperature. I'm just very quickly now running through the first few sonications. You can sort of see the blue dot, hopefully, uh, in the crosshairs there. And as the temperature goes up, uh, the temperature rise goes up, uh, the orientation can change uh, 
basically, you know, as they're verifying that the hotspot's still kind of where we're aiming, that you know, they alternate the orientation of the 2D thermometry sequence. Um, and again, this, this is, in a, is a target in the thalamus, the, the, the VIM nucleus for a central tremor. Here I'm just scrubbing through the time series so you can actually play these back after the fact to watch the evolution of the temperature. Okay, so uh, most of you, I'm sure, are, are aware of this, so uh, just mention it briefly, but the proton resonant frequency is, is slightly sensitive to temperature. Uh, so we can use that by taking a baseline image and then a series of images during the heating event to compare the, the resulting phase change and map that to a, to a temperature change. Um, this makes a couple of assumptions that are sometimes easily violated. So number one is that we know what the temperature was at the beginning. This is only gives us relative temperature change. Uh, it means we have to wait long enough for cooling that we return to that baseline temperature before we uh, allow any more energy to be given. And it also assumes that nothing is moving. Uh, motion artifact uh, can cause uh, lots of, uh, of apparent uh, phase change that isn't real. So here's an example of uh, a central tremor patient, uh, pre-op on the left, post-op on the right. Um, his drawing sample top left before the treatment and drawing sample immediately uh, after the treatment on the top right. So the, the effect, the improvement that you see is uh, somewhat miraculous when you, if you see these live, that these patients really do have a, a very immediate and profound improvement uh, that's mostly stable um, after, the, after the treatment. So he, he's doing a task here where he's trying to move beans from one cup to the other, and he, he really physically can't do it on the left, and he's doing it uh, easily on the right. And he, here's just an example of what these lesions look like over time, uh, one day, seven days, and 30 days after. So uh, on the, the bottom left, uh, this enhancing ring and T2 is, is really what the surgeons are looking for to kind of gauge whether they've had the effect they want, and that resolves um, pretty dramatically over the, the first month um, post-op. Uh, there's been at least one study to look at the, the accuracy and precision of this technique, and uh, at least this group, um, which at the time had, had one of the largest cohorts of patients, you know, were, were convinced that they could get targeting accuracy within a millimeter of, of where they meant to. This is the, the group in Solothurn in Switzerland. All right, so what are the challenges of this technology? So this is a, a map now of uh, kind of where we're constrained to, to treat. So if, if we look at all thousand elements of this array and the angles at which each of the axes of the beams emitted by those elements hit the skull, uh, if, if they hit the skull at, at 90 degrees perpendicular, uh, very efficient as that angle gets more and more uh, steep, that efficiency falls off a cliff. And this basically has the effect of limiting uh, treatment to this central green region. So in this case, with this skull at a assumed bone speed of 2,900 meters per second, that green area is the area where 70% of the elements or more are still effective because of their incident angle on the skull. Uh, yellow is half the array is now useless and red is uh, worse than that. All right, so here's uh, the array looking down the, down the bore. Uh, we'll put a, a head in there and slice it down to the to the target spot, so the focal spot is in the middle there. I'm gonna move it to, in a minute, to something a little bit more relevant. But if, if the speed of sound of bone was the same as water, there'd be no refraction of the sound go traversing the skull, and you'd get straight beam paths uh, from each element center right to the target. Um, sadly, this is not the case. The speed of sound in bone is about twice what it is in water, and so uh, I'm sorry that I invented the law, but Snell's law says that refraction will happen. Uh, and uh, so here, here I'm dialing at about 2,900 meters per second, and you can see instead of a nice sharp focus, I get kind of a diffuse ball. Now you can still get a focus because these really aren't laser beams. They're uh, 
the beam profile is, it does have a finite extent. So as long as it, it still overlaps the target and we're, we stay in phase, uh, you'll still get a, a focus there. But this is one of the things um, in addition to the incident angle on the outside of the skull that limits us. And of course the bone itself absorbs 80 to 90% of the energy uh, that you try to put through it. Uh, so all these things conf conspire to make this a challenging problem. So if we look at the outside of, of the head now, and now for each of those beams where they strike the skull is a colored circle. Uh, green is a good incident angle and red is beyond the critical angle where really total reflection happens. So as we move away from the center very quickly, um, the efficiency of the array uh, falls off uh, to the point where it's, it's not feasible to, to heat what we want. Um, if, we, if we slice back inside again and, and do the same thing, you can sort of hopefully appreciate um, how these incident angles change as we move toward the, toward the bone. Um, you know, very quickly all the, the beams become inefficient. So now we're going left, right. So not only do we, we lose the, the energy contribution of the beams that have very uh, high incident angles, um, but we also lose the ability to steer and we lose some focal quality because we don't have uh, homogeneous uh, arrangement. So the other thing that's against us is the phase aberration caused by the skull. Uh, here's just a, cr a cross section through the CT showing a selection of these beams and th this distance D through the bone is pretty much different for every element and down below, you can look at the, the phase that would phase change that would happen based on that distance, and it's basically proportional to the difference between the speed of sound in bone and the speed of sound in water. Uh, and, and because of this, every beam essentially gets a, a, a different phase contribution. Uh, we, and this is the one thing we can correct for. So if we can model this accurately enough from the CT study of the patient, then the, the inverse of this phase can be applied to the signal we send and basically we can refocus through the skull. Uh, this is a, a, a poorly done example of a hydrophone study, but on the left, if uh, through a, uh, just a, a ex vivo calvarium, if we send a, a non-phase corrected signal through it, we get a very diffuse, in this case, even a split focus. Uh, on the right is a very simple phase correction just based on the thickness of the skull that each beam sees and a fixed bone speed, which isn't really true. You can do probably half again as better if you actually compute bone speed per element, but just to show that we can get a single focus back that's uh, pretty compact and is recentered uh, on the natural focus. And uh, this is some of uh, Dennis Parker's group's work so as I said before, for now, clinically, people are doing uh, monitoring with MR thermometry just in 2D. So this is an example now of, of trying to do this in a phantom. So this is an ex vivo phantom filled with a, a tissue-mimicking ultrasound gel that, that heats somewhat like tissue. Uh, so instead of just a 2D plane, we actually get a 3D slab. And the advantages here are that we, we definitely know for sure that we're seeing the whole focus in three dimensions. So there's not a chance, as with 2D, that I might miss the hot spot and, and underrepresent the temperature change. Um, also, I can see some, some remote heating. So in the, on the right-hand case, where we're aiming kind of at the medial aspect uh, of the temporal lobe um, near the skull floor, I think on the bottom right there, you can see a little bit of a, of a green glow coming off of, of the bone there. So it's actually showing some bone heating in the far field. So as we look at these targets that are getting more peripheral uh, for safety uh, and to make sure we're waiting for temperatures to return to baseline, it's very important eventually that we have this kind of imaging. And this is just another slide of that same study just showing that there's a good agreement between uh, 2D and 3D. Uh, so uh, for now, um, What's been going on clinically has mostly been centered on movement disorders. Uh, the next talk, I think we'll talk more about this, but central tremor, Parkinson's disease. But there's a host of others uh, that either are just beginning or will shortly um, be under clinical investigation. Uh, so I think this, this technology will uh, make a lot of contributions to, uh, to neurosurgical treatment. We've also just talked about thermal ablation. There, there's a host of other mechanisms that FUS is capable of. Um, Blood-brain barriers just starting to be investigated, um, but you can see all these others here, and they're all under uh, preclinical investigation at the current time. I want to talk about just one quickly before my time is up, and that's histotripsy. So uh, here's a, a different kind of array. Um, 
The difference is that instead of a continuous sort of sinusoidal application of ultrasound, it gives a very short, very high pressure pulse. So by very short, I mean half cycle or single cycle at instead of six megapascals, 20 or 30 or even higher megapascals, but on a, such a short interval that no heating really can happen. Uh, and at that, those kind of pressures, instantaneous cavitation happens, which uh, causes a liquefaction of tissue at the focus. So this is an example of a, a ex vivo skull phantom where uh, this group at the University of Michigan were able to, to make a lesion within five millimeters of the skull, which with thermal ablation we simply can't do at the present time. So, uh, and here's a, a preclinical example in a porcine model of making very focal um, very accurate, predictable lesions with, without any hemorrhage or, or other uh, apparent pathology other than this uh, sort of homogeneous slurry of, of um, tissue where, the, where this uh, cavitation event happens that really doesn't even have any recognizable cellular organelles left in it. Um, so I think this is what, you know, th these are kind of the directions we're going in the future to overcome the limitations of the treatment envelope to be able to address hopefully all of the cranial contents one way or another with this technology, either for drug delivery or for ablation or for, in this case, uh, histotripsy. And I think I'll stop it there. Uh, I don't know whether we have time for questions now or want to just, yeah, okay. So I'll hand this off to the next speaker. Thanks very much for your attention.